Okay, so Steve Blake is a faculty nutritional biochemist at Hawaii Pacific Neuroscience. He has offered many classes at the University of Hawaii. He has designed the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, a clinical study at the Hawaii Alzheimer's Disease Center. He is personally involved in conducting this clinical uh, that uses dietary changes and nutrients found in his targeted nutritional supplement, Brain and Body Food, which you can get here. Uh, Steve Blake authored The Diet Doctor, uh, software for analyzing dietary nutrients. Uh, one of the causes of most of our disease process is deficiency of nutrients, so that's a very good software program. It gives a detailed analysis of your dietary fats, tocopherols, carotenoids, and many other nutrients. He has also maintained one of the world's largest databases of plants used medicinally called the Herb Doctors. He studies scientific research on the connections between food and disease. He sees himself as a translator of the medical literature into under understandable science-based language. Steve Blake attended the University of California. He is a research specialist in nutritional biochemistry. He lives on a solar-powered organic farm on Maui with his wife, Catherine. Welcome, Steve and Blake. Well, welcome. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, I do read the peer-reviewed science literature, and I feel like I work with a lot of neurologists, um, ger gerontologists and neuropsychologists who use drugs, like most of modern medicine, on neurologic diseases. And the drugs can have helpful effects. With Parkinson's disease, there's no doubt that the drugs have helpful effects. But they don't look, generally, at nutrition and nutrients. And so I get the wonderful position of being able to find out ways that heal, that help, that slow progression, and that are completely non-profitable, which is really fun for me. Because instead of developing drugs, I look for things that help people that are generally not a patentable thing. You know, food, you can't patent bell peppers, which I'll talk about. Um, but on the other hand, they can be tremendously helpful. Tonight's talk, I'm going to break it into three segments. The first segment is our bodies make dopamine in the substantia nigra pars compacta. I'll show you a picture of where that's in the middle of the brain. And if the dopamine gets very low, then the symptoms of Parkinson's can develop. So we make this dopamine ourselves from an amino acid tyrosine which gets transformed into levodopa, but we also can take drugs that have levodopa in them. Both of that leads to more dopamine. There are dietary proteins that can inter interfere with this process. So whether you're using tyrosine to make your dopamine the way we're designed, or you're using levodopa to boost your dopamine the way drugs are designed, the dietary protein can really interfere with this process or not interfere which can have some wonderful effects. And some of the people we're seeing are able to control their Parkinson's with less drugs or, in early cases, no drugs, just, just by changing protein. So that's, that's interesting. The second thing I'm going to talk about is there are certain toxins in our environment that seem to be attracted to this midbrain of the area that kill off the cells that make dopamine. Well, wouldn't it be a good idea for us all to avoid those toxins? So I'll identify them, tell you what foods they're in, and how you can avoid them. Uh, by the way, I'm going to get to this later, but I have to tell you now, when Parkinson's is first diagnosed, typically 60% of the dopamine-producing cells in the brain have already died off. So all of us in the room who have not yet developed Parkinson's disease, we may be down 10% in our dopamine-producing cells. We may be down 40% or 50%, but not showing symptoms yet. So delaying the progression of Parkinson's disease might be very helpful for all of us in this room and not just people who already have it. Neurodegenerative diseases, all that I've studied, take decades to develop. So let's not develop them. Now the third step is that, and this is common to many neurodegenerative diseases, especially Parkinson's disease, the cells die off because of oxidation. Brain cells are typically very fragile. They have 
membranes made of phospholipids with very fragile fatty acids, uh, arachidonic acid and docosahexanoic acid are, you know, four and, and uh, six times desaturated, very fragile, very easy to oxidize them for them to die off. So antioxidants form a, a really good defense for us to keep our brain cells alive. And of course, the side effect of that is to protect all of your brain cells, not just the ones that produce dopamine. This is a picture that you can see of where the substantia nigra is. It's in the middle of the brain, and of course it has to do with movement. And so Parkinson's disease is a movement disorder. So it's clear that it would be near the spinal column, kind of on top of the spinal column in the middle of the brain. When the cells die off that make dopamine, then Parkinson's disease can develop. And I'll show you a picture um, showing that rigidity, tremors, and gait disturbances are things that people really notice at first with Parkinson's disease, cramped handwriting and mass face and several others. Protecting these dopamine-producing cells, dopaminergic in medical literature, that, that's our goal. We want to protect these cells so they don't die off. My talk tonight will focus on the progression and risk reduction. And really, there isn't that much difference. Because things that slow down the, the risk of getting Parkinson's disease are also going to slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease. So no matter where you are on the continuum of, you know, maybe someone in this room has 100% of their dopamine cells or still intact, and, and maybe someone in this room only has 70%, you know, maybe 30% intact. Whatever it is, we want to protect whatever's left and slow the progression of cell death in the brain. To, to everything. Uh, so at any stage, dietary changes can help. At any stage, avoiding those toxins can help. At any stage, antioxidants can help. So it, I hope that all of us will benefit from this talk. Uh, here's a little diagram that shows the this typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. People may notice at first a uh, shakiness of the hand. Now, essential tremor can be confused for Parkinson's disease if the hand's shaking a little bit, but when you move the hand, essential tremor stops shaking. But with Parkinson's disease, if the hand is shaking and, and you have Parkinson's disease, it's more likely to continue shaking. Uh, Catherine Hepburn's famous for having shaky lips, and you can see that um, there's a stooped posture associated with more advanced Parkinson's disease, a mask-like face that doesn't um, show emotion so well. Uh, and a very slow gait called bradykinesia, but uh, difficulty walking, difficulty initiating movement, and cramped handwriting. There's lots of signs of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's is a progressive disease. I have to say that among neurologic diseases, Parkinson's disease is one of the nicer ones to get. I know that's a crazy thing to say about a disease. And yet, on the other hand, people live long, healthy lives with Parkinson's disease. Uh, you know, we're working with an old guy who's had it for 35 years, and he's walking with a, a stick, and um, he had been falling down every day. But luckily, due to some dietary changes, he's now not falling down, and that's right there, really a good thing. Uh, there are scales that tell the progression of Parkinson's disease. So the Hohen and Yar scale is an old one. One is almost normal, and by five, you're wheelchair bound. So it, it tells you where in the continuum of this very slow moving neurologic disease that you might be. There, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale is a more exact test, and it, it looks at different things. Mental clarity and function, behavior and mood can be, you know, dopamine is involved in behavior and mood too, and addiction and lots of other interesting things. So, as you lose dopamine, other changes may occur. Uh, that one looks at activities of daily living. You know, can you feed yourself and go to the bathroom and close yourself and all that, that stuff. And of course, movement, which is the crux of it. Now there is Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia is caused by misfolded proteins, sometimes alpha-synuclein. And these misfolded proteins can occur in the memory and thinking areas of the brain, not the midbrain at all. And that this is not an automatic thing with Parkinson's disease, but it may develop and co-develop with it. And I've got some ideas for you on Lewy body dementia, some things that would slow down the 
the folding of these proteins and even a few things that might disaggregate the misfolded proteins. The standard of treatment for medical doctors for Parkinson's disease is levodopa and it may be mixed with carbidopa or many other drugs. There's also uh, monoamide oxidase inhibitors, MAO inhibitors for short, and what these do is slow down the degradation of dopamine, you know, much like the drugs that slow down the degradation of serotonin. Uh, and so there's more dopamine in the cell, so less symptoms. The levodopa is absorbed from the intestine into the bloodstream through the large neutral amino acid transporter. And this transporter can get saturated. So if you have too much protein in your intestine, at that time, the levodopa and also the tyrosine are not absorbed well into the bloodstream. Well, very similar transporters work at the blood-brain barrier to move the levodopa or the tyrosine into the brain. And of course, dopamine itself cannot transverse the blood-brain barrier, so no one gives dopamine as a drug. But levodopa is a precursor, so that's given. Again, if there's too much protein in the bloodstream, then the absorption of levodopa and tyrosine into the brain isn't as good. I made a little diagram to show this. So here's tyrosine, dietary tyrosine, very easy to find in the diet. You don't need to go to great lengths to get it. And then tyrosine is transformed in the midbrain. Tyrosine hydroxylase is the enzyme into levodopa. Or you can take levodopa as a drug. Either way, these are inhibited by excess protein from actually getting to where they're needed to make dopamine. Then the levodopa is transformed by aromatic L amino acid decarboxylases, that's a mouthful, isn't it, uh, into dopamine, which then can be degraded by monoamine oxidase, the B type of that. So this is how it works. And we're going to talk for a minute about how protein prevents this from happening. So we have to get the levodopa in the dopamine producing cells before they can make dopamine. And if you can't get the tyrosine or the levodopa there, then you can't make dopamine. A study was done in Italy by researcher Luciana Baroni. And when I first read it, I showed it to our neurologist who's really our expert on Parkinson's. And she, I said, they're getting 50% reduction of movement disorders by changing diet. She said, no. They must be testing at the wrong time. There's an on stage and an off stage with Parkinson's. She said they must be testing. So I corresponded with Luciana Baroni. We're in an international scientific group on nutrition. And she was kind enough to write back and describe that, yes, they were testing at the right time. And this, this study looks very, very good. It was a plant food diet that she was using. And why plant food? Because plant foods are lower in protein than animal foods. Uh, and they also have more antioxidants and more fiber to slow the absorption of these things too. So, and of course, most of the Parkinson's patients in her study were taking levodopa. This is the standard of care. It's very, very common. After one month on the diet, motor function scores were twice as good as in the normal diet group. One month, that's really quick. Uh, it was found that reduced protein increased the transport of levodopa and tyrosine into the brain as I've been describing. I do give um, citations here on the bottom of the screen. This was in Nutritional Neuroscience 2011. Uh, all of my information is based on peer-reviewed scientific studies. None of it is based on books, magazine articles, other lecturers, hearsay, um, websites, or anything else, just peer-reviewed literature. Uh, and even so, I very carefully choose the research that I look at. I very carefully screen the research to make sure it's not sponsored for one thing, or if there are mistakes in the research. And some people collect stamps, I collect research studies. And um, I have over 5,000 and 200 folders that I have found to be really good studies, and I rename them so I can find them and then put the citation up for you. A Couple other studies I want to share. A plant-based diet helped after only one week both tyrosine and levodopa were more effectively absorbed and transported in order to increase dopamine production in the substantia nigra of the brain. That was just from the Neurology Journal, 1988. A another study uh, reported in the Archives of Neurology used a low but adequate protein diet, 
significantly prolong the effectiveness of levodopa therapy. Uh, I'll elaborate on that for a minute. In early Parkinson's disease, someone may be given levodopa once a day or twice a day, and it works to control symptoms. But as Parkinson's progresses slowly over the years or decades, the doses become closer together until they're three hours or two hours apart. At a certain point, like with this nice old guy who's had it for 35 years, even giving drugs every hour isn't enough to control the symptoms. There, there's still a lot left over. So by prolonging the effectiveness, this is very, very useful. So I'm not suggesting that people discontinue levodopa and carbidopa, whatever drugs they're on, but I'm urging that people make them more effective. And I'm considering a diet that is adequate in protein, but not excessive. So, uh, yes? And how many grams a day would that be? Mm -hmm. A very good question. How many grams a day of protein are adequate and how many are excessive? Well, with my Diet Doctor software, I analyze diets, not just individual people diets, but types of diet, Atkins diets, standard American diets, and you know, raw food diets, and all kinds of different diets, even the Bulletproof diet I've analyzed. So I look at the amount of protein that people get, and actually our need for protein for everyone in this room is probably gonna be something like 50 grams. That's, that's very well established. Uh, the World Health Organization, the Institute of Medicine, just about every government body is all, they've all come up with about 10% of calories should be protein as an adequate range. But nobody gets that little. I, I mean, virtually no one. Uh, three people in 30 years of testing I found they were actually low in protein, but their dietary intake of calories was also too low to sustain life. So if you get adequate, pro adequate calories, you're more than likely to get adequate protein. So low protein, while uh, a wonderful myth, just doesn't seem to exist if people are getting enough calories to sustain life. High protein, on the other hand, is extremely common. Typical American diets run about 150 grams a day. Uh, Mediterranean, about 100 grams. Uh, Bulletproof, around 200 grams. So this is 50 to 100 to 150 grams of excess protein. That excess protein is then going to compete with tyrosine and levodopa for the large neutral amino acid transporter, both through the intestinal wall and at the blood-brain barrier, and reduce the effectiveness of both tyrosine and levodopa for Parkinson's disease. A study was done in Brazil. Now, Brazil ate a lot of red meat, so they didn't cut out all meat, just red meat, and they added some B vitamin to it. Uh, motor skills improved 60% in six months with a 50% improvement in only three months, just from reducing red meat. And of course, red meat has a lot of protein. And so that was one of the ways. There may be some other ways that I'll describe in a minute that the red meat may be also contributing to Parkinson's disease. Um, they use riboflavin, vitamin B2 as well um, in this particular study. But again, that, that's pretty good results. Knocking down motor deficits by 50% is really helpful. That has been effective in delaying the need for medication in many people, which is, is a good thing, because the medication has side effects. And it can perhaps lower the dose or the frequency of dose of people, because mostly people in Parkinson's are self-controlled in their dosing. You know, if their symptoms don't come back, they wait a little longer. If they come back harder and faster, they medicate a little sooner. Plant fiber, as I mentioned, slows the absorption of tyrosine and levodopa, and that helps get the symptoms smoother. So you need less medication at less frequent intervals, and then it's more slowly absorbed. A clinical study on this down at the bottom. So which diet is perfect? Well, finding a low-protein diet that meets all of your nutritional requirements is really pretty easy. Basically, that's going to be a plant-based diet. Um, but in the later stages of Parkinson's disease, people tend to get too thin. This seems to be just part of the disease. There's a lot of uh, energy burned up in tremors and rigidity that burns up a lot of calories. So it can be done that you can have a plant-based diet higher in fats if people are getting very thin. In fact, this, this wonderful old guy who has had Parkinson's for 35 years, my wife is especially good at describing recipes for people to, you know, help 
do what we're talking about. And the recipe she gave him was uh, avocado with um, chocolate powder and a sweetener, vanilla and a pinch of salt, stirred up or blended and put in the freezer as ice cream. This is extremely high caloric. If you're trying to lose weight, forget about this. But it's really yummy, too. And no one would su suspect that there's any avocados in there. So the idea is that we're using something low protein but high calorie to assist people in keeping their weight on without getting that protein that's going to cause trouble. If we use cow milk, then that would be much higher protein. So a lot of casein and whey in there. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, he has. Like I say, he, he had his first day without falling down. Oh, uh, w really remarkable, um, shortly after he changed his diet. And um, we'll be seeing him again when we get back home. Changing patients' diet is something that my wife and I work in a neuroscience clinic, and our job is to help people understand why and how they can change their diet to prevent strokes, to lower the risk of epilepsy, um, Parkinson's disease, uh, many of the neurologic diseases, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, working I'm slowly working through all of these diseases, and compliance can really be a problem. If you're telling someone, well, you might get a heart attack in the future if you don't, you know, lower your saturated fat intake, people don't listen too well. I mean, so what? There are no symptoms until you drop dead. But this is different because people with Parkinson's disease have symptoms all the time. And if those symptoms go away within a week and come back within a few days as they change their diet, then compliance will be much, much better. And in fact, compliance has been found good. In, in Luciana Baroni's study, compliance was excellent on this diet. It can be made tasty. My wife has a cookbook, Healthy Recipes for Friends with all plant-based nutrition in it. So people can eat this diet and have a guideline for how to make things cheap, tasty, fast to make, and yet still low in protein. Now I want to talk about food contaminants. You know, standard registered dietitians look at the nutri nutrients in food, but they don't look so carefully at the contaminants in food. Well, I find studies of the contaminants in food really quite fascinating. I call this gloom doom, uh, but it needs to be looked at. Which food contaminants are going to kill off the dopamine producing neurons to speed up the progression of Parkinson's disease or to increase the risk of it? Well, here they are. Um, this study is a recent study in the American Journal of Epidemiology. The large study showed a decrease of Parkinson's disease with decreased dairy consumption. People with the lowest dairy product consumption had 60% decreased risk. Now, one thing might be the excess protein, because uh, dairy products have a lot of protein. When I analyze diets, I see that you know, dairy adds a big chunk of extra protein to a diet. But another thing may be excess pesticides that are concentrated in fatty substances. And I'm going to talk about some of these pesticides as I go through. The persistent organic pollutants persist in fatty substances, and then perhaps a cow might eat these substances through her life and put them in her milk, and then people eat the milk or cheese throughout their life and concentrate them in what part of the human body is the most fatty part? The brain. So if someone calls you a fathead, it's a compliment. It's, it's supposed to be fatty. Unfortunately, some of these contaminants concentrate right in the dopamine-producing cells. So it's a really good idea to avoid them. Uh, Another study showed an 80% less risk of Parkinson's disease in men who consumed less dairy products. Not none, but just less. And a study in Honolulu showed 2.3 times less Parkinson's disease for people who did not consume dairy products versus those who were heavy dairy product consumers. A lot of people are lactose intolerant in Hawaii because there's a lot of Asians living there. So a lot of people don't eat it. So good study population for that. Eating organic food, I noticed all the food tonight was organic, can be helpful. A big meta-study looked at 46 studies to see if pesticides in general increase the risk of Parkinson's disease, and the risk was 62% higher. That's a pretty big boost in risk. If there were job-related exposures, 150% increased risk, so one and a half times the risk there. With um, So I think for people with Parkinson's disease, Organic food would be an exceptionally good idea. 
For the rest of us, I think it's a good idea. It's getting cheaper. Animal fat tends, as I mentioned, to concentrate the persistent organic pollutants like dieldrin. There's a class of pesticides called the organochlorines, heptachlor, dieldrin, lindane, uh, DDT is in that class, and uh, there are many other uh, pesticides that have been used throughout many decades, and they persist in the environment. I mean, you find them in penguins in the North Pole. You find them everywhere. You, you know, wild salmon in Alaska have these in them too. It's very, very, virtually impossible to eat a fatty food that doesn't have these pollutants in them. Um, so dieldrin has been found in the brains of Parkinson's disease patients much more than in normal people's brains. Lindane, another organochlorine, raised the odds of getting Parkinson's disease four times over people who had low lindane levels. That's a really amazing amount of more uh, reported in the Archives of Neurology, an excellent journal in 2009. Major potential dietary sources of lindane include milk, eggs, dairy products, and there's lesser extent fish too. Now PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, were used as um, insulators and in transformers, and they also were used in um, fireproofing, other things. They accumulate in fat, just like the other persistent organic pollutants. They're found throughout the world. They've been shown to damage cognitive function, so this is a problem for all of us, uh, whether or not we have Parkinson's disease. They're very hard for the brain to eliminate. They're called persistent organic pollutants because we really have no mechanism to get rid of these things. And the brains of Parkinson's disease patients have been found to be much higher in these polychlorinated biphenols than normal brains. But in 1977, they were banned, right? But uh, they just switched to a different one. I'll tell you about it in the next slide. Polychlorinated biphenols lower the production of dopamine, exactly what we don't want. They inhibit Tyrosine hydroxylase, remember tyrosine hydroxylase is the one that takes dietary tyrosine that's been absorbed into the brain, converts it into levodopa. Levodopa is the drug that's used for tyrosine, for Parkinson's. So this is an important enzyme to help dopamine production and it's damaged by this. The other enzyme that it damages is aromatic acid decarboxylase which makes dopamine from levodopa. That's damaged too. So there's specific pathways that these do. Also, when dopamine is made inside the cell, dopamine itself can be oxidized and very damaging to the cell and kill the cell unless the dopamine transporter is there to move it to the uh, vesicle near the synapse. Well, that also is damaged by poorly chlorinated biphenols. And that damage is enough to kill off dopaminergic cells, dopamine producing cells. So it's a good idea to avoid polychlorinated biphenols. As I mentioned, 1977 they were banned and now we have polybrominated diphenyl esters. Arguably even worse, chemistry is very similar, they do the same thing. They interfere with the same enzymes, they concentrate the same substantia nigra pars compaxa in the brain and damage, do a lot of damage to the dopamine making neurons. It's interesting, these also contribute to excitotoxic calcium signaling. If you know about epilepsy, and another disease that we treat in our clinic and I've worked up a nutritional guideline for, it's a lot about excitatory neurotransmitters, glutamate versus, you know, GABA. The, anyway, this one's not a good thing. Where, is it, where are they found? They're both found in fish oil. Now, Looking at this will give you some pause to actually gobble down capsules of fish oil. Some fish oil is distilled to remove some of these, certainly not all. Studies show, show that they're not all removed, but at least knock that huge bar on the top down a little bit. And fish themselves are by far the highest source of polychlorinated biphenols and polybrominated diphenyl esters. Eggs and dairy products both have quite a bit too. You'll notice what's in common. Fat, that's what's in common. These persistent organic pollutants accumulate in fat. The baby food um, is kind of heartbreaking, that um, fatty baby food, obviously vegetable baby food wouldn't have this in there. Um, 
beef and even vegetable oils concentrate a little bit of this stuff that's just ubiquitous in the environment. However, fruits, vegetables, and cereals have virtually none. So this may be another reason why the plant-based diet is so effective. Yes? Yes, they occur in both organic and non-organic because these are not currently used. Most of the organochlorine pesticides have been banned in America and they're not currently used, but they're just in the environment and fatty substances absorb them. There is, by the way, uh, really not much in eggs that you can't get somewhere else if you didn't want to eat them anymore. Um, you can certainly get phosphatidylcholine, uh, one of the four phospholipids from many other sources. Beans are an excellent source. And um, the amount of carotenoids is tiny anyway in, in eggs. So you, you could possibly live without them. I do. Seems to work. So it's interesting to know where these things are. Okay, where in your diet are they? Mercury is a big one, too. Now, I'm not even going to talk about Fukushima and radiation in fish because I don't know all the details. I don't know how much is in there or what the pathways are into that part of the brain. But mercury, we know very well that fish eating is the principal way that Americans get mercury, methylmercury, the dangerous form of it. It binds to cysteine, so it can be transported across the blood-brain barrier by the same neutral amino acid transporter that we've been talking about. It has a substantial impact, mercury, on the normal function of it. When they say nigrostriatal dopamine system, the dopamine is formed in the substantia nigra, and the axons of the nerve go, they're long, you know, in motor nerves. They go into the striatum, another part of the brain, to initiate action. So this is, this is a system that they damage. They increase oxidative stress. They damage mitochondria. Mitochondria are the energy factories of our cells, and when mitochondria and brain cells are damaged, that often leads to brain cell death, apoptosis, programmed cell death. Uh, so we want to make sure that our mitochondria are well protected with antioxidants and not attacked by substances in our diet. And then, of course, all of this results in lower dopamine production. This is from Neurotoxicology, a recent study in 2012. Okay, we got through the toxins. That was pretty tough, huh? Uh, some of our foods might not be as healthy as they were once. Now, these foods I'm talking about 100 years ago wouldn't have any of these pollutants in them. But this is 2015, and they do have them now. Now, I know soy products are one of the many beans, and genistein is a substance in pro soy products that's anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. It's been very well studied. In this case, they use purified genistein, um, and the treatment reduced the dopamine-producing neurons from injury. It improved learning and memory, so it's actually an animal study, and it restored tyrosine hydroxylase. So that restores the ability of the dopamine-producing cells to transform tyrosine into levodopa, an essential step and a really important one. So when this is damaged in people before, during, or later stages of Parkinson's disease, it's really a good idea to restore this enzyme back to life. Uh, they saw that, in fact, the dopamine levels went up after administration of genistein. Uh, so it is possible to get purified genistein, but on the other hand, you could just eat some beans. And if you're going to eat soybeans, I think I'd recommend the organic ones, especially if you have Parkinson's disease and certainly also if you don't. <laughs> now, yes? Would it also be really important that they were non-GMO soy products? Well, organic soybeans are by definition non-GMO, so that takes care of it. They are? Right. Yeah, the, the organic definition means they're actually tested for it to make sure they are not genetically modified. Um, so we don't really know the effects so far. I haven't seen studies on how GMO products might affect Parkinson's disease. But I adhere to a, kind of a precautionary principle. Until GMOs are proven safe, then I don't think it's wise to eat them. And that'll be the day. Uh, <laughs> could take a while. So another favorite food, sesame, sesame seeds. Sesame is a heat-activated antioxidant found in sesame oil and sesame seeds. And it modulates the expression of tyrosine hydroxylase, which means it helps the cell make more tyrosine hydroxylase is, an, is a protein that genes produce in the cell. 
So we make a little more of that, we can make more dopamine. Yes, in the back. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear. Is, is the mechanism of action of the increased tyrosine hydroxylase through special transactions on a CAMD, through adrenal cycles, uh, is it an intersection in the CAMD increase? It's a good question, and I can't answer that for you at this time. Okay. Um, suffice it to say that it is protecting that system, and um, this study didn't mention the CAMPs, and so I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, both anti-inflammatory and antioxidative. And those, those are the actions by which it protects it because enzymes can be vulnerable to oxidation too. And I'm, you know, th this, is, this is new stuff. We're delving into it. And I'm, I'm thrilled to see that uh, we're gonna learn more and more about this as time comes on. But so far, um, sesame actually has some interesting actions. Um, it increases superoxide dismutase, which is, uh, especially the mitochondrial form of superoxide dismutase, the manganese form, protects our mitochondria, and this really helps too, because making dopamine requires energy. And so by assisting energy production by, by having our mitochondria stable and not oxidized, a good one too. Fruit eating helps reduce risk and pr pr progression. Uh, big study, over 130,000 people uh, reported in the journal Neurology just a few years back. They looked for 20 years, and people who ate more fruit had 25 to 40 percent less risk of developing Parkinson's disease, and principally because of the flavonoids, which are anti-inflammatory and antioxidative. Uh, of course, organic fruit would be a good idea because pesticides are often sprayed right on the face of the fruit that you eat. Um, flavonoids, again, protect dopamine neurons from oxidative damage and cell death. Now, this is a real interesting one. You know, cigarettes are protective against Parkinson's disease. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that we all go smoke a pipe. However, nicotine has an interesting effect. It's a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor. So the enzyme that gobbles up dopamine in the dopamine-making cells is inhibited. So it gobbles up less dopamine, so there's more dopamine to quench the tremors and smooth them out. So instead of smoking, I have for you bell peppers today. Um, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease by 19%. But in people who never smoked, risk was reduced 87% by peppers. So most peppers you can't eat that many of, but bell peppers you could. Organics very important with bell peppers because they're in the dirty dozen of most sprayed and sprayed right on the surface there. So they reduce the, the uh, the amount of, well, they increase the amount of dopamine effectively. Yes? Just a quick comment. Nicotine upregulates tyrosine hydroxylase, which is, um, which is the enzyme you were talking about earlier. I'll show you a citation for that. Okay. Um, they don't affect tyrosine hydroxylase. Instead, they affect MAO. Now, the MAO B inhibitors are often used for Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's one of the drugs that many people with Parkinson's disease are prescribed in order to prevent the breakdown of dopamine and, and have more dopamine left in the cell. So I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, there's medicine for you. It's, uh, it's red and beautiful and uh, a lot of fun, chewy, tasty. Coffee, black tea, and green tea reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease, 40 to 50 percent. Some studies showing a little less, 25 to 30 percent. Caffeine itself reduces risk. And, uh, I don't know the mechanism for this. Uh, caffeine has been found to stimulate many processes in the brain, obviously. It's what most people use it for. So I want to talk a little bit about antioxidants and how to protect our brain cells from damage and destruction. When our brains break down dopamine with monoamine oxidase, which is inhibited by peppers, but when they do, we form hydrogen peroxide, which is a dangerous free radical in our brain. However, that can be transformed into water by which enzyme? Glutathione peroxidase. And glutathione peroxidase absolutely must have selenium in order to work. 
If we don't have enough superoxide dismutase, the permeability pores in the mitochondria can open and just leads right to cell death. So that means one more dopamine producing cell has died, and that's not what we want. So we want to make sure that we get enough dietary selenium. How do you do it? Well, you could eat brown sesame seeds, but not white ones. They have a fair amount of selenium. You can eat uh, Brazil nuts, have a lot of selenium, but you also can get a toxic amount of selenium if you eat too many Brazil nuts. So it's a, kind of a balancing act to get the right amount of these nutrients. Well, I did, because these and these enzymes are involved, um, the superoxide dismutase especially and the glutathione peroxidase are involved in other neurodegenerative diseases, I did develop the brain and body food to have the right amount of these minerals in them to support our endogenous, our own human enzymes that are antioxidant. One reason, yes? If you just repeat that louder, something about the acoustics in here. Well, I know selenulene is an antioxidant, and um, it's been compared with vitamin E a lot. And um, it looks like vitamin E works better, and I think I might trust vitamin E a little bit more too, if it happened to be in one of the natural forms, which is extremely rare in the marketplace. I, I did put the real, not synthetic, alpha tocopherol and an equal amount of the other three tocopherols in my brain and body food, but it is almost impossible to find it on a store shelf. I know of only two manufacturers in the country that even make it. Um, okay, so why is oxidation such a problem for people with Parkinson's disease? Well, one reason is that rigidity and tremors burn up a lot of energy, and when you burn energy, you can make more free radicals. It's just normal. For instance, more exercise creates more free radicals. Now, I think we should all exercise, then, but we need a little bit more antioxidants when we do exercise and if we don't exercise. Well, rigidity and tremors are not exactly exercise, but they also create more free radicals. Uh, the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, as a side effect, knocks out some free radicals, and those are typically eaten up by coenzyme Q10 and superoxide dismutase, the manganese form. Also, tyrosine hydroxylase, as I mentioned, can form reactive oxygen species, specifically um, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And metabolism of dopamine makes reactive oxygen. That dopamine has to be sequestered in vesicles uh, right away, which is interesting because <coughs> When people are given levodopa, some of the side effects are because the levodopa goes to serotonin-producing cells, which also can be then made into dopamine, but the serotonin-producing cells have no way to sequester the dopamine, so the dopamine oxidizes and can kill the serotonin-producing cells. That's one of the reasons for some of the side effects of levodopa therapy. And finally, neuroinflammation itself creates reactive oxygen species. Our brain has immune system components called glia, and normally they service the cells, they prevent them from dying. If they're in really bad shape, they kill them off. But if they become overactive, then free radicals increase, and they often become overreactive in Parkinson's disease. So excess iron can increase oxidation in the brain, and specifically in the dopamine areas. Uh, one reason why the non-meat diets help is because there are two forms of iron. There's non-heme iron and there's heme iron. Now, heme iron's only found in blood-containing things, so it's found in beef and pork and chicken and fish, but it's not found in dairy products. Uh, it's also not found in any vegetable products or plants of any sort. The way it works with iron is our bodies are very, very careful not to get too much iron in because it's such an oxidant. We need some, but not too much. So dietary iron of the non-heme type adheres to a receptor inside the intestine but is not directly absorbed. If our bodies need iron, it can reach in and pull it in, but if we don't need iron, it goes away. However, the heme iron is absorbed regardless <laughs> of need, so it can lead to too much oxidative stress, and that can damage many areas of the brain, not just the dopamine-producing cells. 
This study, these two studies are really looking that oxidative stress is the underlying mechanism by which the dopamine producing cells are killed off. And so, I mean, maybe 60% are already killed off by diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. In advanced Parkinson's disease, we may only have five or 10% of the dopamine producing cells left in order to produce all the dopamine we need. And there's no other way to get it in the brain. So these are the antioxidants. From plants, we have carotenoids in fruits and vegetables. They're all fat-based antioxidants. Then we have vitamin C from plants, or if you're taking it in a supplemental form, I would recommend only the fully ascorbated forms and not the similarly sounding ascorbic acid form. Ascorbic acid is irritating, pH 3, poorly absorbed, and ascorbates are neutral pH and are rapidly absorbed uh, quite easily. Vitamin E, again, from nuts and seeds, avocados, olives, these are really good sources of vitamin E. Uh, I don't generally, even though there is vitamin E in many oils, I don't generally recommend that people use a lot of food oils. And if you want to know why, I have a book uh, called Understanding Fats and Oils, A Scientific Guide to Their Health Effects. It's on my website for under 10 bucks, if any of you want to read it. If you don't have 10 bucks, email me, I'll send you a copy. And <coughs> certainly you can learn a lot more about how oils are processed. And the fact is, when they take a bean or a seed or a nut, and they process it into an oil, they're taking out a lot of the goodness and leaving you with almost pure calories, but without a lot of the things that you want in there, like vitamin E or fiber or manganese or magnesium or so many things are pulled out. And then there's a rancidity factor and the hexane solvent. Anyway, interesting chapter on how oils are processed. Polyphenols are found in berries and other plants, like this beautiful picture up here of beautiful berries. The proanthocyanidins are some of the most useful ones found to go into the brain and protect our brain cells, both memory areas and the substantia nigra. Now, the ones we make in our bodies, there are many, actually. I didn't list catalase and some of the others here. Very little catalase made in the brain anyway. Uh, zinc, copper, and manganese are needed for superoxide dismutase, selenium for glutathione peroxidase, and coenzyme Q10 is needed. It's the only fat-soluble antioxidants that humans make. Fat-soluble means they protect our LDL and their low-density lipoproteins and their transport through our body, which is essential for lowering their oxidation and resultant atherosclerotic problems with heart attacks and strokes. They also protect our brain cells. So a really good idea to have coenzyme Q10. We make it. Every cell in our bodies makes coenzyme Q10, perhaps a bit less with age. And if you're taking statin drugs, they've been found to lower production in the body by about 40%. Uh, taking supplementary coenzyme Q10 is not as good as making it in your body, but certainly uh, something that any of us could consider since it's extremely safe and uh, possibly a good idea to protect our brain in many ways. We're using coenzyme Q10 in the clinical trial that's now running in Hawaii, the Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial, uh, as an antioxidant booster. The antioxidants all work together. All of these work together. So you don't want to be deficient in one. You want to have a broad spectrum of antioxidants. I look in diets to see how they do on antioxidants. The standard American diet didn't do very well in vitamin C, vitamin E, or carotenoids. And the Atkins diet didn't do very well either. The Zone Paleo and South Beach diet did pretty good on vitamin C but didn't get the bare minimum of vitamin E. You know, 93% of Americans don't get the bare minimum of vitamin E. And I think this has a lot to do with neurodegenerative disease. More nuts and seeds would be the key there. However, the vitamin E and the carotenoids were low in those diets. Now, looking at a transition vegetarian diet, where, you know, you have an omelet in the morning, a cheese sandwich for lunch, macaroni and cheese, and then some ice cream for dessert. This is not a very healthy diet. The antioxidant levels are very low. So, you know, it's not easy to say, oh, a vegetarian diet's healthier. But in fact, it may be less healthy. Now, a Mediterranean diet also didn't have quite enough carotenoids and vitamin E. It came close. It had enough vitamin C. The plant-based diets, this one and the bottom one, they had plenty of antioxidants because a lot of nuts and seeds were eaten, so vitamin E, a lot of Fruits and vegetables are eaten, so a lot of vitamin C, and the same reason carotenoids. Now, the Ornish-McDougall diet are examples of 
heart attack proof diets where very little fat is eaten of any kind. No food oils, no avocados, no nuts and seeds, nothing fatty. So they're not getting the vitamin E, in fact, three milligrams recommended 15 minimum, um, not getting enough even vitamin C, and the carotenoids are low. Plus, on this diet, the carotenoids are unlikely to be absorbed because there's just not enough of a trigger. Uh, you need a fatty trigger to trigger gall bile through uh, a, a me chemical messenger called acysticinin, um, and you just can't do it with that little fat in the diet. So that's how the various diets stack up. Um, and you can analyze any of the diets uh, with my diet doctor or some other tool to find out the antioxidants. Now in my dietary program, I broke out the tocopherols, which was fascinating. Because walnuts only had 0.7 milligrams in a serving, in an ounce, of um, alpha tocopherol. So I thought, oh, they don't have much vitamin E. But when I broke out the different tocopherols, I, Gamma tocopherol, 23 milligrams. So you really have to look at the different tocopherols to get a clear idea on which nuts and seeds are valuable. There's only two nuts that I know of that don't have any vitamin E. Any guesses? Hmm? No, cashews have some vitamin E, less than normal, yes. Peanuts, no, peanuts are pretty good. Peanut butter is a good source of vitamin E. You're cheating. <laughs> She's editing my fat book again. Um, coconuts and macadamia nuts are the only two nuts that don't have vitamin E. And they don't need it. They have a husk and a shell, protect them from heat, light, and oxygen, the three things that make the seed rancid and kill it. So they can, they're, they don't need it, but we need it. Speaking of vitamin E, delayed the progression of Parkinson's disease an average of 2.5 years. A couple of studies here are showing that High-dose alpha-tocopherol. I'm not a big fan of synthetic alpha-tocopherol because first of all, it doesn't include the other three tocopherols. Second of all, synthetic alpha-tocopherol is a mixture of eight isomers, only one of which is really alpha-tocopherol. Four of the eight are completely ineffective as vitamin E, which means if they're implanted in a brain cell to protect it, they don't do anything. It's like a security guard that's blind, deaf, and dumb and has no gun. But somehow, it's very cheap to manufacture, and there's a lot of profit in it. Uh, anyway, um, I have some ideas that vitamin E should really work in the brain and in the arteries and not be ineffective and cheap. This study looked at vitamin E and beta carotene, reducing oxidation. In, it, it reduced risk of Parkinson's by 55%, just vitamin E, and that's the wrong form. And beta carotene reduced risk by 44%. Again. I prefer a mix of carotenes rather than just beta carotene. Some of the studies with a single carotenoid were not so favorable, but when you start mixing them up, for instance, in my brain and body food, I put a mixture of six different carotenoids mimicking how food is, you know, a broad spectrum of these things so they can all fill in. This study was done in Japan, and so the vitamin E and the beta carotene were from food because these people didn't take supplements. So food-based vitamin E and beta carotene reduce risk by roughly half each. And they're very easy to get, a handful of nuts or seeds a day. In our Hawaii Dementia Prevention Study, I designed it so people are getting an ounce of walnuts because people are old, perhaps poor digestion, and perhaps diverticulitis. Uh, we're having them grind up the walnuts and the sunflower seeds, one ounce of each to get the gamma and alpha tocopherol in their diet. Kind of a nice, natural way to, to get them in there. Yes? Um, in, in reference to your statements on, uh, on that, uh, I was wondering how uh, pecans fit. Pecans also have gamma tocopherol, and they're a good substitute for walnuts, because sometimes walnuts can be a little bitter uh, or even rancid. They're both very delicate. Walnuts also have alpha linolenic acid one of the only two essential fatty acids that humans need. The other one, linoleic acid, we all get way too much. So it's hard to call it essential. Extremely rare, any deficiencies. But omega-3 plant-based form is very common to be low in diets. And walnuts supply that along with gamma tocopherol. So it's a two, two for one pack. And pecans are great. Yeah, also very similar. Yes? Why grind the walnuts? Why grind the walnuts? One reason is because when we digest fatty substances, 
if you look under a microscope and you chew up the walnuts and you see little mountains, the mountains can be digested only on the outside. And the rest goes through to ferment, perhaps in diverticuli, bowel pockets. And, and uh, enough older folks have bowel pockets that their doctors say no nuts. However, if they're powdered or blended, uh, for instance, my wife in her recipe book has a, a creamy walnut dressing. Ooh, that's good stuff. And the walnuts are all ground up fine. So our digestive enzyme can get up to a thousand times as much gamma to cofrol and vitamin E out when they're ground up or blended as opposed to not. And there's no problem with bowel pockets. So that's why. Good question. Uh, yeah. Well, that's another way to do it. You can soak your nuts, or you can grind them up, or you can blend them. And it, it varies, um, but you can do one or two or all three if you like. You can soak them, grind them up, and blend them if you have time. But any of the three methods will help a lot and in order to do it. And the, the I, I don't really have much problem. The days of soaking almonds overnight and taking the skins off, I think, are over, uh, for me anyway. Uh, just life is busy, you know, can I say. Sure. Certain vegetables really reduce movement problems. Now, especially the cruciferous vegetables, kale's all the rage right now, but cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, uh, collards, these are all really helpful. They are rich in antioxidants and neuroprotective. They have sulforaphane, which is an isothiocyanate. And it is really better to, um, to chop them up first or blend them first and let them sit for a little while because there's an enzy enzyme called myrosin that creates these isothiocyanates like sulforaphane, which are powerful cancer fighters, really excellent. You put them in a Petri dish with healthy and cancer cells and the cancer cells die off, but not the healthy cells. So they're, they're really useful substances. Uh, treatment with sulforaphane reduced motor deficits and protected the dopamine producing neurons in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. So that sounds like something healthy in many other ways that you could incorporate into your diet. Just eat more cruciferous vegetables, perhaps instead of other vegetables. Now berries are also found to keep dopamine producing uh, neurons alive. Neuron means brain cells. They took extracts from blueberries, grapeseed, hibiscus, blackcurrant, and mulberry, and they're rich in the proanthocyanidins. That's found either in the red, blue, or purple pigment, depending on pH. They exhibited great neuroprotective activity. They reduced motor deficits and problems with the ability to create energy in mitochondria in, in a mouse model of Parkinson's disease. They have a way to mimic Parkinson's disease with a certain drug. And uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that. And then they test things on it. Yes, sir? Any comments on sauerkraut? Well, sure. Sauerkraut would be excellent. You're starting with cabbage. And the fact that it's sitting for a while, the myrosin is able to create the isothiocyanate. So sauerkraut sounds like a real winner. In fact, it sounds delicious. Mulberries, again, berries are very protective to the brain. The, uh, in the nurse's health study, they found that one cup of berries a day delayed dementia by an average of two years in the nurses who ate the cup of berries versus the nurses who didn't. And mulberries are really good. Any berries will work, though. You don't have to find mulberries. I mentioned coenzyme Q10 before. The supplementation decreased the damage to the mitochondria and the loss of dopamine and protected the dopamine-producing neurons against degeneration. Also, when they checked Parkinson's disease patients, they found the coenzyme Q levels, levels were low. Of course, one reason is from statins, which lower that. Another is just old age. We don't produce quite as much coenzyme Q10. Uh, so it might be a good idea to consider supplementation of coenzyme Q10. Uh, safety concerns are not a problem with this particular one, um, especially in the amounts of 200 to 240 milligrams per day that we're using in our studies. It was found to be safe for older folks. Vitamin D, as illustrated by this young lady making some, stabilized patients, Parkinson's disease patients' motor symptoms and prevented an increase in progression of the disease compared to people 
who didn't have it. Now, what's really interesting here is that vitamin D supplements helped, but vitamin D containing foods made it worse. And you think, why? What are vitamin D containing foods? Like fish oils, right? And the fish oils have all these contaminants that destroy the dopamine producing cells. So it was very interesting that vitamin D on the one hand really helped and on the other hand was unhelpful. Ashwagandha is sometimes been called Indian ginseng. It's not a related species, but it's been used in East India in the Ayurvedic traditions for a long time. It's a nourishing plant root. Uh, Withania somnifera is its botanical name. It significantly increased dopamine production in brain cells and alleviated gait disorders. Uh, this is from a, a study in the Journal of Aging Research and Clinical Practice, and also in, in another uh, journal study, Molecules. The plant root has been shown to increase antioxidant enzymes and reduce damaging products of lipid peroxidation. Melondialdehyde is a difficult word, but one to learn. This is a product of rancid fats and very damaging. Can produce adducts to DNA and cancer. So it's a good thing to avoid, and ashwagandha seems to quench this. Only seven days of treatment, it reduced this. And it may promote neurite growth, which we now know is a way that nerves in the brain can regenerate. So there's a lot of good effects from ashwagandha. And it seems to be very safe. Do your own research, but I have found it to be a gentle uh, plant and not too scary at all. There have been many, many peer-reviewed studies on this plant. Ginkgo biloba, coincidentally, we're using in our Hawaii Dementia Prevention Trial as one. Now, you should not take ginkgo biloba if you're on blood thinners, such as warfarin, prodaxa, xeralto, or eliquis. If you're on any of these blood thinners, don't mix it with uh, ginkgo biloba. The internal review board did say that 81 milligrams of aspirin was not a problem, and I did the research on that. So that may be okay uh, to take ginkgo with that small of a blood thinner. I, I think it probably is safe, judging by the research. But again, do your own research. Consult your doctor if you're taking aspirin or any other blood thinner uh, with that. Neuroprotective effect, reduced neurotoxicity, and um, really helped with oxidation. That's one of its main things. It also opens up the blood flow to the tiny capillaries in the brain. So many students are using it to pass finals. It's one of the most used plants in Europe. And what's it used for? Boosting brain power, memory loss, cognition problems. Now, gambir, interesting looking plant with the little hooks. Uh, Uncaria ranchophila also has a neuroprotective effect. It reduced loss of the dopamine producing cells. It's just exactly what we want to lower risk of Parkinson's disease and slow progression. Increased antioxidants and slowed cell death. Turmeric's a very well-known plant, and turmeric contains curcuminoids. Curcuminoids are fat-soluble nutrients notoriously difficult to absorb. Uh, they protected the dopamine-producing neurons against neurotoxicity, and kept them alive, basically um, reversed the depletion of dopamine-producing neurons, and also helped stabilize tyrosine hydroxylase to make sure that you could make your own levodopa in your brain. They reduce inflammation, which is one of their well-known effects. Now, with turmeric, I usually recommend, if you're taking a little capsule of turmeric, a half a gram or a gram, the amount in the studies are showing you're getting just a few nanograms into your bloodstream. Perhaps a little benefit, but not much. On the other hand, if you make a curry, several tablespoons of turmeric powder, and put in all the other you know, vegetables and delicious foods that you want, a little bit of black pepper so the piperin can increase absorption of the curcuminoids dramatically, then you've got a delicious medicine that you eat. And then you can get a significant amount of turmeric into your body in a very healthy and delicious way. Rosemary's also been found to be protective to dopamine-producing cells. Decreases iron levels in the substantia nigra to decrease oxidation. It has carnosol, which protects against neurotoxicity from rotenone. Rotenone is a pesticide, thankfully now discontinued, that came really close to causing Parkinson's disease. In, in other words, 
Rotenone created the symptoms of Parkinsonism and perhaps is one of the causative factors in Parkinson's disease. It has been banned for a while and so hopefully it's only used to kill fish now and not for any other purposes. I want to mention briefly a little bit about antioxidants and Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia is associated sometimes with Parkinson's disease. By, by no means all people with Parkinson's disease get Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia makes up perhaps 15% of the dementia. Uh, the vast bulk of dementia is Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. Now a component of turmeric, curcumin, was able to prevent the aggregation of these abnormal proteins in Lewy bodies. Sounds like more curries in order. Coenzyme Q10 also inhibits the concentration of these malformed proteins from clumping in Lewy bodies. And beta carotene and the other carotenoids also stop the aggregation into Lewy bodies. So this can help all of us because Lewy body dementia can be experienced by anyone with or without Parkinson's disease. Now, there's uh, two substances, bicolin and, and bicoline. They're flavonoids that have been shown to reduce the depletion of dopamine in the substantial nigra and hinder the aggregation of alpha-synuclein. So they're very helpful for Lewy body dementia. Bicolin's really an interesting subject. It comes from Baikal skullcap. And skullcap has several flavonoids that inhibit overexcitation of the brain, inhibits ex excitatory neurotransmitters can be very damaging and increases the soothing, quieting neurotransmitters in the brain. So it's a very interesting flavonoid that's being explored now in my epilepsy protocol. I do use this. Also found uh, similar substances in passion flower, which is passiflora species. Uh, long used for epilepsy and, and other neurologic problems, but now we're finding out why and the, the things in them. Actually, these two from Skullcap were found to break up the abnormal protein aggregation in Lewy bodies. Um, it sounds like a really good idea. However, a uh, caution, if you were to take some Skullcap tea, it might make you sleepy. So you certainly would want to experiment with this in the evening when you're not driving or operating heavy equipment. Um, and it, it might interact with other sedating drugs or influences to make you sleepy. Um, there was a time when I was incredibly stressed out and when it was time for bed, I was exhausted, but I had this nervous enervation, almost like electricity in my brain, you know, still going. And I would take just a little quarter cup of Skullcap tea and immediately feel the effects of it just taking the buzz off. At that point, I didn't know enough about the neurotransmitters to know what it was doing, but I knew enough that uh, my exciting thoughts were over and it was time for bed. Yes? I wonder if that would work against tinnitus. Against? Tinnitus. I have not seen studies of bicolin and tinnitus, but it uh, might be a good idea to get on Google Scholar and give that a look. Um, I'm not sure. Good question. So I want to talk, kind of summarize my dietary protocol for Parkinson's disease. We need to reduce protein to needed levels. Now practically, the way to do this is to not eat excess protein. Now, okay, it's time for me to give true confessions here. Um, I'm a plant-based guy. I've been a plant-based guy for 45 years. I'm now 65, so I started when I was 20. Even though I eat a strictly plant-based diet and no animal protein whatsoever, my average daily protein is 83 grams. I need 46. 50, be fine, but I get 83. In other words, there's just no way to get it down to 50 if you're getting enough calories to stay healthy. However, if someone were to eat a plant-based diet and then add one meal, you know, bacon and eggs, then instead of getting, say, 75 grams a day, they probably get 100 to 110 a day. And then if you add a, you know, turkey sandwich for lunch, you might be up to 150 have a big steak for dinner, you could be up to 200. So basically it's animal products that add the excess protein, which if you don't have Parkinson's disease and you're sure you're not developing it, then it may not cause a problem. But on the other hand, precautionary principle might be a good idea to keep your 
protein level down. Now, in Parkinson's disease, one strategy is that if you are going to eat protein, for instance, even people on a plant-based diet for Parkinson's are eating beans or tofu or one, something organic, of course, in the evening, not during the day. Because the symptoms are worse after protein. It's something that people really notice. So if you're shaking in your sleep, it's not so bothersome as if you're shaking during the day. So displacing protein intake till the evening is a good strategy whether you're still eating animal products or you're eating protein from plants, which also can push you over the top. Beans have a lot of protein in them, so you have to be careful with excess protein from any source. I analyze my diet, that's how come I know how much protein I get, and I encourage all of you to analyze your diet, then you know how much protein you're getting. And other in interesting things like saturated fat and calcium and all the vitamins and minerals. Avoiding dietary toxins, yes? So given that we commonly see gastric stasis with Parkinson's, how much of that do you think plays into the issue of the protein and undigested protein that are sitting in the gut? Well, studies on protein digestion, at least in healthy people, show that protein is really exceptionally well digested in human intestine assuming that you have some hydrochloric acid output <laughs> from your parietal cells, which is a pretty big assumption these days. But um, in general, the Institute of Medicine has looked at protein digestion and found that 75 to 95 percent of the protein is digested of all the various sources. How about in Parkinson's? In Parkinson's, well, it happens in older folks, and older Americans are very likely to have digestive disturbances. I could probably look at the digestion of carnivorous animals like cats, omnivorous animals like dogs or bears, and vegetarian animals, and I can make parallels with human digestion so that you could actually look at an animal's internal parts. Lips, tongue, teeth in humans are very much like vegetarian animals and not at all like carnivores. Uh, you know, carnivores have a flat, thin tongue and lips that are very thin and can't manipulate food. Alpha amylase betalin, starch predigesting is in our mouths and in vegetarian animals, but not in carnivorous animals. The trachea is very different in human because we have cartilage rings causing choking, and choking is almost always from meat eating, um, very rarely from any other cause. Our stomach acids are about as strong as a tomato, whereas a dog or a cat's stomach acid is more like battery acid, enough to kill the bacteria off. So for good digestion, what we really want to do is feed the animal what it needs. I mean, you could take a polar bear and feed him fruit, and he'd live for a while, but it's not the ideal diet for him. And you can feed a human all kinds of crazy junk food, fast food, you know, other things, not the ideal thing. So I would like all of us to have optimal health, and to do that, we need optimal food and optimal digestion. And I, I think that digestion and the bacteria in our stomachs plays a huge role in all diseases. But again, if someone were to move to a plant-based diet for Parkinson's disease, chances are pretty good that their E. coli levels would go down dramatically and their lactobacillus levels would go up. So that would certainly help the bacterial levels in there. Thanks for a very good question. But we can avoid animal toxins. It's as simple as avoiding animal fat. Now, avoiding animal fat has a side effect that means you're going to get less saturated fats, and that's directly related to heart attacks and strokes. So despite Time Magazine, uh, it really is related to heart attacks and strokes, and so that's a good side effect from that one. We can increase dietary antioxidants. You don't want to change your diet in other ways. Have a cup of berries, more fruit, cruciferous vegetables, nuts and seeds for vitamin E. You can just increase your antioxidants, and that'll help in two ways. It'll increase your antioxidants, and it might crowd out foods that don't have antioxidants. After all, which foods have no antioxidants? Ice cream. Hmm? Ice cream. <laughs> ice cream? Not, yeah, very, very little in ice cream. However, the equally delicious uh, almond-based ice creams have vitamin E in them, and they are truly delicious and really competitive with dairy-based ice creams. So you can have ice cream and antioxidants. Can have ice cream and eat it too, something like that. <laughs> um, increasing bell peppers is a strategy to help 
Instead of taking monoamine oxidase drugs, you can eat some more bell peppers and see if that can help control symptoms in Parkinson's disease, a tasty alternative. In my wife's cookbook, Healthy Recipes for Friends, she's got a recipe called Best Friends, where she slices up bell peppers and cashews into tiny chunks, lightly sautés them, and they become best friends. And that way, you're getting your vitamin E and your nicotine all in one delicious topping. And then you put that on top of other things. You can reduce Lewy body formation with turmeric, coenzyme Q10, and Vicolin from Skullcap. And there are many plants and spices that help reduce the progression and risk of Parkinson's disease. I haven't presented you with all the research that I've done on Parkinson's, but I think hopefully your brains, even in this Mensa group, are satisfyingly full. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. If there's any other questions for Dr. Blake, you can go ahead and ask them now. Okay. Wait for the mic, please. What are your thoughts on um, juiced vegetables, juicing vegetables? Juicing vegetables? Yes. Well, there's a problem with juicing vegetables. You run, you know, things through the juicer, and you get a cup of juice. What else do you get? A big pile of stuff. And there's polyphenols and carotenoids and all kinds of fiber and good things in there that might be really good for your health. So an alternative might be blending instead of juicing. Then you get all the good stuff in there and lose nothing. There are times when juices are good. If you're, you, there are definitely times for juicing. But consider most of the time blending preserves, well, your dietary dollar too. I mean, you're throwing away a lot of good stuff. Any other questions? Any comments on stimulants that are based on the dopaminergic system? Well, stimulants, huh? <laughs> Dopamine plays other roles in the body, and that is a really good and very deep question. Uh, dopamine is involved in addiction patterns and many other things, and as far as attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, dopamine has a lot to do with that too, uh, way outside the scope of this lecture, and I also have to admit it might be a little outside of my expertise, but I think that it would be fascinating to research that. You had a question over here? Uh, it's a little bit obtuse. A friend of mine has had Parkinson's since he was even, I think, 11 years old he was diagnosed. He's very heavy, but he takes some kind of, I wish I could remember, berry or substance coming from South or Central America. Do you know what that is? And he swears by it. I should. What's it called? I cannot remember. Oh, that's a good one. Um, it's best if you take it ground up, the I cannot remember. Ah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, it might be Gambier uh, that I mentioned in, in, this, in this discussion. Um, there are many, many plants. I have a database of plants used in 54 countries and region worldwide. I have 168,000 footnoted facts in there, and certainly Parkinson's has many plants that have been used for it all over the world. Oh, what I like is that my database kind of assembles where the great herbalists agree on Parkinson's. So this would be empirical science, different than the rational science that I use normally. Yes. Um, do you have a sibling? And have you compared yourself with your sibling? Your age different? I'm fascinated about your hair. It's dark, and you sense you revealed your age, is it natural? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes. My hair is actually its natural color, and if you look closer with your glasses on, you will see some gray hairs in there, and I am 65. I'm now on Medicare. Thank you very much. Um, and I have found that several times over the years, my hair has started to go gray. 
And it's interesting that those times coincided exactly with when I ran out of vitamins. And so at certain times that we did a sailing trip and we ran out of vitamins, my wife says, hey, your hair's getting gray. And I took the vitamins. And the weirdest part is that the gray out on the tips went away, too. Isn't that odd? Really odd. Anyway, I don't know. Um, I do try and stay healthy, uh, healthy diet, exercise, living in the, the forest in, uh, on an organic farm, which rains avocados in Maui, is really good for stress levels compared to the freeways here. Can't believe how rude people are. Um, so all of these things, and freedom from environmental toxins, I do the best I can. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm working on trying to stay young as I get old. Hold, hold on, we'll get that mic over to you. Your sibling, do you compare yourself with your... I have a sister who's three years older, and I cannot comment on the grayness of her hair. She <laughs> might watch this video. How about your parents? <laughs> How about your parents? Did they, did they, have, a, did they have a good genes? That My parents got gray hair, yeah. They're not around, so I can comment on them. Yeah, no, Thank I you. don't think it's genes. I, you know, I really don't look at genes so much as medical doctors typically do. I'm a research scientist. If I haven't mentioned this before, I'm not a medical doctor. Um, genes are an excuse. But really, we can do so much with our genes. Now we know they can be epigenetically selected to turn on or turn off just because we have a specific gene, ApoE Epsilon 4, that might give us four times the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Doesn't mean we can't turn it off just with two B vitamins that make Sammy. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to ask about the peppers. So, including bell pepper in your diet. Is it one pepper, how, about how much pepper? Red pepper, and it can be any color? Yeah, the peppers, not only any color, but the hot peppers too, but I figure people won't eat very many hot peppers because, well, they're hot. Um, so the bell peppers you can eat quite a bit. I think there's just a, a rational amount of bell peppers you can eat in a day before uh, you get too many of them. Uh, you know, they're very, very high in vitamin C as well, higher than oranges. Isn't that interesting? Yes, Michael. One of the studies mentioned B2. Is that, in your mind, very relevant? Um, perhaps not. They didn't have controls on the B2, vitamin B2 riboflavin. So because they didn't have controls, I'm not going to listen to that part, but they did have controls on the red meat. And so that's the part of the study that I found fascinating, that they cut motor deficits in half in three months just by reducing red meat. So that's something people in this audience could consider if they want to continue to eat animal products, perhaps just shift the ones you're eating and, and get their risk down that way. Is there any problem with deseeding peppers, taking the seeds out, and then any comments on strawberries as a berry to eat? I didn't quite hear. Is there any problem with taking the seeds out of like a hot pepper? Does that decrease the effectiveness? And then strawberries, you didn't comment on this. On it's strawberries? Strawberries, simple question. Strawberries, yeah, strawberries are very rich in proanthocyanidins. In our clinical trial, we're using either blueberries, strawberries, or red grapes to get the proanthocyanidins uh, to protect the brain cells, and they protect the dopaminergic cells just as much. As far as the seeds, I don't think that's where the nicotine is. So you probably, most people do take the seeds out of bell peppers. Uh, and when they analyze them, they analyze the edible portion, which is without the seeds. I don't know what's in those seeds. They might be good for you, though. <laughs> Have to check. Okay. Zeolite. Uh, speak right into it, please. Zeolite to remove toxic metals? Well, he's asking about zeolite to remove toxic metals. Um, Zeolite is a mineral from Hawaii, and um, it has the ability to really latch on to heavy metals and hold them and bind them very tightly, uh, at least until they get too many heavy metals and then they, they don't. Um, however, zeolite being a mineral, I have seen no way that zeolite could possibly be transported out of the intestine into the bloodstream or any other part of the body. So think that zeolite would be effective in binding heavy metals in the intestine, but not anywhere else. So they could be helpful in that way. And I discussed this with a professor at University of Hawaii who's a zeolite expert. And um, 
he can't find a way they could ever get into the bloodstream, neither can I. I mean, you're talking about little rocks somehow being transported through the, the stomach lining, you know, the intestine lining. I, I don't think that's possible. I've looked into it. Oh, I just wanted to reply also to your question about the hair color. And I was there. I've been with him for 25 years now. Mm. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I've seen it. It's gone gray black. Gray black. Gray. We're in a black stage now. And so what, ha what I like to do, what I like to think about is whenever we see ourselves not flourishing, we look at how many aspects of our life we can alter to maintain optimal health. And so we're consistently improving. It's a journey towards rejuvenation every day. So um, it can be done, though. It's and great. my wife, while still much younger than I am, also has no gray hair. And, and she's I'm 60. And I didn't say that, but she did. <laughs> but she's 60, and she's doing very good for gray hair. And I think that our brain and body food, you know, it's got some great B vitamins in it. And I'm taking them, if only for the gray part. Am I vain like everybody? Oh, no. And the clean <laughs> food. Clean food. Yeah. And, yeah, that helps, and too. And other healthy habits. And Thank love. you. Thanks for all your questions there. Make it a lot more fun for me. Yeah, I also have a question about zeolite. Um, is it helpful if you put a powder in the water regarding um, cleaning the vegetable uh, and pollution from the vegetable? Well, is the zeolite in the water would absorb heavy metals. That's what it does. Um, so yeah, I think it would pull any heavy metals out. You know, there are many ways to purify water, but that's one. <laughs> oh, hi. Uh, have you ever done detoxing or Never flush or heavy metal detox? No, I personally haven't really done that. I did some fasting when I was younger, but um, I didn't really like the, um, the liver flushes. Um, and I don't, haven't found the real need for that. If I do want to do a little liver cleansing, I would use herbs for that. There's some wonderful plants, the bitters, basically. I know we're talking about Parkinson's, but do you have any advice for ulcerative colitis? <sighs> you know, I have a lot of studies on ulcerative colitis, and it'd be really hard to, to sum that up. Um, again, look at what influences might make the lining of your intestine and your colon uh, irritable, such as coffee, alcohol, um, sugar, lots of things that can do that. Look at things that might make your lining of your whole digestive tract a lot more soothed and mucilaginous, like slippery elm root, which is, or marshmallow root, or oatmeal that are very soothing to the intestinal tract. But there's lots more to it. I have a big folder full of research on ulcerative colitis and also irritable bowel syndrome, and I think that diet has a huge effect on those things. So uh, maybe you can get in touch. Oh, oh, hold on. Aloe vera, good, good idea too. Yeah, anything ending in ITIS is inflammatory. So like you said, reducing sugar, you know, all the inflammatory properties. Mm -hmm. Curcumin is anti-inflammatory, right? And Absolutely. quercetin is a really good anti-inflammatory. Yeah, and curcumin is going to work really well in the intestinal tract because it doesn't need to get absorbed. And absorption is the problem with the curcuminoids. No, that's curcumin. But no, don't take the black pepper if you have ulcerative colitis. I'd skip that. And, and probably only eat sweet peppers, you know. Yes, um, I wanted you, for you to talk a little bit about the rigidity in Parkinson's disease. You mentioned it as, I mean, I remember you mentioned the tremors as, you know, a, a expenditure of energy, you know, and calories. That's why, you know, you say uh, people with Parkinson's disease tends to be thin. You know, what about rigidity? I mean, how does it? Well, the, the same thing. Rigidity, I mean, if you think about it, it's like clenching a muscle. Oh, and okay. this is burning energy, and the oh, burned up energy increases your caloric need. And oh, getting those okay. calories without getting a lot of protein means you're really going to have to lean on some fats. But mm -hmm. there's very few fats that you can eat that aren't associated with protein. Mm, so, yeah, um, you know, carbohydrates, it. of course, like lots of potatoes and sweet potatoes and all those things, uh, and the various grains that are, right. of course, non-gluten grains, um, those, those things are ways to get calories. But even grains can add up to enough protein to be bothersome. 
So that's, that's why the avocado fudge was a really good trick for uh, a man who's very thin in later stages of Parkinson's. I, I saw rigidity as like paralysis, but it's actually like clenching. It's an active yes. uh, thing. Yes, it is. And it does burn a lot of energy and create more free radicals. So again, a, a concentration on antioxidants is good as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm curious, um, the people that have this reduction in symptoms, for example, vitamin D, how much, how many IUs do you recommend, or what is the blood levels, nanograms per milliliter that you consider as, you know, like, is it 80, and that you have observed that causes this reduction in symptoms? Right, good question. Example. Because there are two measuring scales for blood levels of vitamin D, um, I like to just look at supplementation levels. And the uh, current upper level is 4,000 IUs per day, and I consider that an extremely safe upper level, and would recommend somewhere between 2,000 and 4,000 IUs of cholecalciferol, the vitamin D3 form, uh, for people living in temperate climates like this. In Hawaii, perhaps 1,000 might get away because we're exposed to a lot more UVB over there. So that, that would be the level. The levels in the blood vary by the standard that you use, nanomoles or nanograms. Right. You don't know. Th I know the nanograms well, so because here the labs, they give, so yeah. you don't know that. Well, each testing scale is a little bit different. So when you get your blood test back and it says you have 50 and the normal range is 40 to 80, then you know you're doing well. If you have 30 and the normal range is 40 to 80, then you know you're not doing well. So it just depends on your lab and their testing protocol. There's lots about vitamin D. I'm in an international group of vitamin D scientists and I get hammered with papers almost daily on vitamin D. It's, it's fascinating stuff, really useful. Um, it's something I think all of us could potentially benefit from uh, supplementing. And one more question. Yeah, yeah, and how much, for example, ashwagandha, how, how many milligrams, like a thousand, two, three times a day, or about the amounts? For yes, I can't. Or is it one pill that's usually like 500 milligram? <coughs> Just curious about the ashwagandha amount. Ashwagandha is often in Chinese medicine made into a soup or a stew. Mm. So it's not so simple in the dosing. And I, I suggest you look into that more. It would be difficult for me to say. It is fairly safe, check into it yourself, but it, it, I have not seen drug interactions or side effects from it that were bothersome in any way, but check into that. And um, you know, it comes in these little sticks that look like large tongue depressors when you buy it from a Chinese store. And you know, typically we put a few of those in a stew or a soup or an herbal decoction where it's boiled for a long time at very low heat. So that's how it's used. It's not a milligram thing. Because here it comes in the health food store in, in capsules and tinctures. So you just, so that's why I was asking that. Yeah, I would have to look into that. I'm not, you know, there's a lot of safety considerations um, before I could recommend a dosage. However, on the side of the bottle that the capsules come in, it probably does recommend how many per day. And then they would know the potency of what they're selling, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It really varies how it's extracted, you know. Okay, one more question, then we're gonna go to break here pretty quick. Hi, I have a question about hydrogen peroxide. You mentioned, you, uh, how do you use it for the diet? Do you have any comment for how the hydrogen how peroxide? How do, do you, you use it? Yeah. Well. Hydrogen peroxide is formed inside the body, inside the nerve cell. And so what we want to do is neutralize it into water. And to do that, we need glutathione peroxidase. And glutathione peroxidase necessarily needs the element mineral selenium. So we need to make sure our selenium levels are high enough, not too high and not too low. And if you're supplementing with it, it should be the selenomethionine form. And um, 55 micrograms per day is the accepted minimum, and 100 micrograms per day, I think is what I put in the brain and body food, is a little more than you need, but far below toxicity levels. So that's how you support the 
efficacy of glutathione peroxidase in reducing hydrogen peroxide. Turns it into water. It's really neat. But thank you, and thank you all so much for your thoughtful questions and your trust. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay.